what I want to do is uh, really to, um, to go through actually a few different stories that uh, have been cooking in the lab, um, looking at different ways and different mechanisms that viruses and a viral family in particular, Calici viruses, um, have evolved in order to uh, manipulate um, RNA granules. And what has been clear in the past few years is that um, there is an increased appreciation that uh, controlling the localization of micromolecules in the cytoplasm is fundamental to many cellular processes. And uh, in response to various uh, stresses, such as viral infection, these, micromole these macromolecules can all condense. Um, oops, sorry, I'm going to uh, get familiar with the little clicker here. Uh, those macromolecules can condense into membraneless organelles that are uh, defined by their lack of membrane, such as uh, stress granules. They're also called uh, biocondensate, where you know all kinds of um, enzymes, aggregation prone protein, RNA binding protein, signaling molecule, or translation complex can accumulate. And this accumulation can actually control many fundamental processes such as signaling, <coughs> metabolism, and translation. And in doing so, it impacts on the outcome of the stress, um, leading potentially to survival uh, or to death uh, of the cells. And stress granules are really uh, uh, a super paradigm for understanding the role of membraneless organelle or uh, biocondensate uh, during stress. So they form in, um, as a consequence of translational inhibition that normally occurs via the phosphorylation or cleavage of specific translation factors. So the, the initiation complexes uh, that are stalled are then recognized by aggregation prone protein and G3BP1 is one of the, one of the key protein driving this. Um, these complexes then collapse or condense into stress granules that are able to impact on many processes. And I guess what's important for the purpose of my talk is that because they've been shown to condensate immune signaling molecule, stress granules have been proposed uh, to have antiviral effects. However, they are, they are also important for um, the response to cancer. They help cells to adapt to the cancer, uh, to the tumor microenvironment. And persistent stress granules have been important or have been proposed to play a role in uh, the, the physiopathology of several uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So in the context of viral infection, stress granules are important, but there are also many stress granules like foci uh, that form. And I just want to give uh, a very quick overview of what is kind of defined as antiviral stress granules and uh, what are uh, also defined as RNAs L bodies that are forming in response to viruses. So antiviral stress granules are thought to assemble early during infection or in response to mutated viruses that have lost the ability to evade the stress granule response. They are associated with interferon production and reduced replication because they condense antiviral proteins or innate immune sensors and effectors. In contrast, RNA-Zell body so far, they've been shown to assemble in response to a poly-IC treatment and RNA-Zell activation. They form independently from PKR signaling, from EF2 alpha phosphorylation, and from translation inhibition. And they do not require the stress granule uh, scaffolding protein G3BP1, but uh, they are linked to mRNA decay through their docking with other biocondensate that are called P-bodies. And I guess what this illustrates is the variety of response or the variety of biocondensate that can, that can assemble in response to viruses and that can mediate um, antiviral response. And I've summarized here uh, some of their properties and I'll come back to that uh, table for the um, latter part uh, of the talk. And so of course, because all of these bodies can be um, 
deleterious to viral replication. Viruses that develop, um, you know, many ways of counteracting stress granule assembly. And I'm not going to go into the detail of all of these, but it basically shows the, the sheer variety of counteracting measures that viruses have, have evolved to um, evade uh, stress granule responses. So what I will show during the talk is that uh, norovirus infection induces a metabolic stress rather than canonical antiviral sensing that promotes viral replication. I will also show you that uh, norovirus infection inhibits stress granule assembly by repurposing G3BP1, that stress granule component. I will show that um, other calici viruses impair stress granule formation via a different mechanism through the cleavage of G3BP1 by a viral protease. And I will finish the talk by describing novel stress granule-like foci that are assembled in infected cells in response to calici virus infection that we named uh, paracrine granules. So if you want to fall asleep now and digest all the nice cakes and uh, treats that you had for a nice uh, viva, you can just remember the, the key messages here. So to look at stress granule, we use um, model viruses uh, and we focus on norovirus. So norovirus is a highly infectious virus that induces gastroenteritis. It's the most common cause of gastroenteritis in, in the Western world. It's respons responsible for more than uh, 700 million cases of gastroenteritis a year. And the huge um, economical burden that you see associated with Noro is basically down to absence of work, mainly from people that work in the healthcare sector or in the uh, food industry. Okay. It spreads very rapidly in enclosed settings, so hospitals, nurseries, cruise ships, um, because it has a low infectious dose. Um, and okay, although the symptoms only last for two to three days, um, there are much more, um, and you know, gastroenteritis is kind of self resolving. In countries where you don't have access to proper rehydration, uh, they can lead to much more uh, serious effects. What's important is that people are symptomatic for two weeks. So if you look at the guidelines, usually when children have norovirus or if an hospital um, staff has norovirus, they are told not to come to work for two days, 48 hours, but they will shed a viral particle for two weeks. Basically, those measures are probably a compromise, but this kind of explains why usually you have explosion of cases once, uh, let's say, the nursery, one kid is, uh, is sick. And so in the UK, we have, you know, around 2 million cases a year. It costs the healthcare system 100 millions of pounds due to closure of um, hospital settings. And we have those common, repen, common reports often in hospitals or uh, restaurants or even like highly crowded events um, of norovirus uh, cases. I guess um, COVID has been good for some things. We've all been washing our hands much more efficiently. And so if you look at lockdowns and increase, increase uh, health measures, you can see that the number of norovirus cases have kind of dropped uh, completely um, when we were in lockdown or after you know the first uh, two lockdowns in the UK. And I haven't got the data for the third lockdown, but I would expect it to be the same. So in a way, it costs the NHS a lot of money, but this can be sorted with very simple hand washing uh, uh, measures. So um, human norovirus is um, very difficult to uh, propagate in cell culture. So we tend to work with two surrogate animal model, feline calici virus and uh, murine norovirus. And so I won't go into the detail of uh, the genome structure because actually for the purpose of that talk, it's not that relevant, but there are, uh, the genome organization is very familiar to other viruses uh, such as uh, pico-RNA uh, viruses. 
So when we started the work, um, we had done quite a lot of prior work to characterize how murine norovirus modulates the activity of translation factor and protein synthesis at uh, the level of specific translation factor. And uh, we showed that it regulated EF4E activity, e e activity, activity, sorry, and that um, the viral protease resulted in the cleavage of few translation factors such as EF3 subunits and EF4G. What we didn't know was the impact of norovirus on the global level of translation. And so what Michel did in my lab was to use ribopyromycillation assays that allow to measure translation at single cell level by measuring the incorporation of pyromycin that gets incorporated in the nascent peptide and can then be detected with uh, specific antibodies. And uh, what we can see here is that in untreated cell, we have high pyromycin level. If we block translation with cyclohexamide, we reduce incorporation level so we can measure translation activity at single cell level. If we look at a kinetic of infection, we can see that as infection progresses in the cells that are labeled with NS3 and that are basically uh, infected, we can see reduced uh, translational activity that we can uh, quantify. What we can see is that as infection progresses, we have a gradual decrease in um, in protein synthesis. Now we know that uh, mostly during infection, stress is sensed by EF2 alpha, one of the translation factors that gets phosphorylated, and this phosphorylation prevents its recycling by EF2B, blocking translation and inducing stress granule formation. So we looked at EF2 alpha phosphorylation level and were able to show that at the time of translational shutoff, we would be able also to detect EF2 alpha phosphorylation, which is kind of um, correlated, right? So we have the shutoff and we have phosphorylation of the main protein that is supposed to induce the shutoff. But to confirm that there was a, a functional link between stress sensing by EF2 alpha and protein synthesis, we used um, um, meth cells that are either expressing wild type EF2 alpha or a non phosphorylatable um, mutant of EF2 alpha, so mutation at the phosphorylated position, uh, serine 51. And what we, what we could notice is that uh, in cells that are, um, that are unable to phosphorylate EF2 alpha, but uh, are infected with uh, MNV, we could still detect a strong translational shutoff, basically telling us that the phosphorylation of EF2 alpha, so stress sensing via uh, EF2 alpha, is not uh, critical for protein synthesis. So that stress, so A, it tells us that the stress sensing via EF, EF2 alpha is non canonical <coughs> and is perhaps related to. A different, um, a different uh, outcome um, of um, intracellular signaling rather than uh, protein synthesis. And so what we did was to try and dig a little bit deeper into uh, the, um, the kinase responsible for EF2 alpha phosphorylation with the accepted knowledge that usually PERC and PKR are responsible during infection for EF2 alpha phosphorylation. And in a way here, um, I'm just going to show you the, the end result, which is that it's another kinase, GCN2, that is driving EF2 alpha phosphorylation. And we can infer that from the fact that if we use a specific GCN2 inhibitor, A92, we can uh, revert EF2 alpha phosphorylation in a dose dependent manner. And if we use GCN2 knockouts, uh, we lose uh, and infect cells with MNV, we lose EF2 alpha phosphorylation, really showing that the um, sensing uh, occurs through that kind of metabolic pathway rather than the normal um, PERC or PKR sensing. 
So this kind of prompted us to ask, okay, does it mean that perhaps MNV infection triggers a different type of stress response than other viruses? And is the metabolic stress response important during viral infection? So the first thing we did was to monitor um, amino acid levels during MNV infection, and we couldn't notice really uh, much uh, changes um, to total amino acid levels uh, during MNV infection. However, when we look at uh, the levels of specific amino acids using um, liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry, we could see that during infection, we have specific depletion of specific amino acid. And um, I haven't put the data here, but what's interesting is that those specific amino acids are actually the amino acids that are highly enriched in viral protein sequences. So norovirus only makes um, six to eight proteins. These proteins are enriched or have, you know, because they're small, they have they don't have a random distribution of amino acids. And the ones that are enriched in the viral proteins are the ones that we see depleted here in the cellular pool, which kind of makes sense. The virus eats all the amino acids that are present in the cell, and potentially that can be the trigger for this metabolic stress. So in um, canonical amino acid starvation sensing, we know that GCN2 is important and we see that activation, but it's also communicated via junk 2 and ATF2. And when we looked at infection, we could notice a 12 hour post infection, activation of uh, junk 2, and uh, phosphorylation of uh, EF2, um, of uh, ATF2. Downstream of this uh, sensing, we have activation of GCN2 and ATF2 transcript, such as uh, CHOP, ATF3, and again, uh, we could uh, clearly detect uh, activation of uh, CHOP or uh, DD3 uh, and ATF3, mimicking during viral infection uh, what we could detect with um, amino acid uh, depletion of the serum. So what we, what we really see here is that MNV infection is associated with um, a starvation type uh, of response. And this correlates with uh, immunosuppression, with the detection of um, TNF-alpha early uh, in infection and immunosuppressive uh, cytokines uh, later in infection. And so to characterize that uh, amino acid um, signaling, uh, amino acid uh, stress signaling. We also use RNA sequencing that um, of infected cell that allowed us to identify a typical signature associated with amino acid uh, stress and uh, the ISR, uh, in particular um, activation of uh, ATF4, 3, CHOP, CHAC1, GAP34, and a factor called uh, GDF15, but no upregulation of the pro-inflammatory cytokines that are usually linked to inflammatory, uh, to uh, antiviral signaling. And we validated some of these, uh, and in particular, uh, I'll focus my attention on uh, GDF15, where we were able to show that um, using antibodies to neutralize GDF15, we uh, were able to increase uh, cell uh, survival and cell variability. And neutralizing GDF15 uh, basically um, induces uh, or induced or rescued levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as TNF or IL-6, um, or uh, STAT5 uh, targets, or proteins associated with the interferon response such as the norovirus antiviral factor MX1. Basically telling us that uh, the activation of, of that amino acid uh, signaling response is important for triggering uh, um, a, an anti-inflammatory state that basically promotes replication. So we can come up with a model in which MNV induces a metabolic stress via amino acid imbalance. 
it stimulates GCN2 and JAM2, an amino acid response transcriptional program um, within which GDF15 is important for creating that immunosuppressive environment that favors replication. But so going back to, um, and so, you know, this is kind of this uh, intermediate conclusion, but I guess what uh, we don't know at this stage is, okay, we have a translational shutoff, we have a non-canonical signaling that's dissociated from uh, PKR. What is the impact on stress granule signaling? And so when we looked at the impact of the translational shutoff on stress granule assembly in infected cell, what we could see is that um, MNV infection uh, wasn't associated with the typical relocalization of G3BP1 into stress bodies, uh, into stress granules, sorry, but instead what we observed was co-localization of G3BP1 with uh, the replication complex uh, NS3 into bodies that are different from stress granules because they are uh, insensitive to cyclohexamide treatment. And uh, when we characterize that in a little bit more detail, we were able to show that uh, G3BP1 interacted specifically with uh, stress granule protein, with some stress granule protein, but not all. For example, it didn't interact with uh, the translation factors that are normally found in stress granule. And so these, together with other data that uh, I don't present, uh, really allowed us to conclude that uh, G3BP1 relocates to a replication complex during infection. Um, and we were able to characterize um, really um, other uh, RNA binding protein relocating to those, uh, uh, to those uh, G3BP1 bodies and showing that when we silenced the expression of those other RNA binding proteins that relocate to um, replication complex and uh, associate with G3BP1, we would impair viral replication, really showing that uh, uh, the disassembly of stress granule and repurposing of the G3BP1 interactome is important for viral replication. So then we said, okay, is that response uh, conserved in other calici viruses? So we turn to feline calici virus, uh, and um, my PhD student, Majid, um, was able to um, show that uh, FCV induces EF2 alpha phosphorylation. However, um, when cells were uh, infected with uh, FCV and then challenged with uh, sodium arsenide, uh, they lost their ability to assemble stress granule. Again, showing that another calici virus, FCV, has the ability to impair stress granule formation. And that could be rescued by inactivating the virus, showing that this is an active process. And to cut uh, a long story short, what Majid was able to show was that uh, during infection, the core scaffolding protein G3BP1 is cleaved uh, by the viral protease NS6. And what's interesting is that we were able to show that this is specific to the feline calici virus NS6, but the murine um, orthologue, so the MNV NS6 protease, hasn't got the ability to cleave G3BP1. So in a way, related viruses are using different mechanisms to disable the stress granule response. MNV relocates G3BP1 to, re to replication complex, when FCV cleaves G3BP1. What's even more interesting is that when we mapped the cleavage site using um, mutagenesis, we were able to map it to position 405. And so when we mutated that uh, cleavage site um, to, an to an alanine and then infected the cell, or, and then treated the cell with, um, uh, or um, expressed, sorry, the viral protease uh, in these cells, we kind of um, lost, uh, the, or we lost the ability of the cell uh, to assemble uh, stress granule. And mapping that cleavage site on the G3BP1 structure uh, showed us that uh, calici viruses target a different binding site 
in G3DP1. So poliovirus and other enteroviruses also cleave G3BK1, but they cleave both the RRM and the RGG domain, whereas FCV only cleaves the RGG domain. And it's important because this is the domain that tethers G3DP1 to ribosomes and increases the condensation of G3DP1 in uh, stress granule. So again, here, um, interesting to see that related viruses use um, basically disabled the stress granule response, but, G3, uh, but MNV does it by hijacking G3BP1 while FCV cleaves G3BP1. And this response is associated with metabolic stress and an amino acid response in order to promote uh, replication and uh, propagation of the virus. Okay? So in the final, um, final, um, Let's say 10 minutes um, of this talk. What I want to do is to uh, share with you our um, latest work on these um, stress responses during Calici virus infection, describing novel uh, stress granule like foci that we have uh, described um, in association with uh, FCV infection. And so going back to our first um, because chrono, uh, let's say chronological order, our first uh, foray into the stress granule field was um, done with FCV. What Majid always observed, and you know, he was focused on lo looking at what occurs in infected cell, but he was also always able to detect some cells displaying stress granule in the vicinity of infected cell. So uninfected cell, bystander, no viral particle, but assembling stress granule. And that led us to uh, postulate that perhaps some communication was occurring between infected and bystander cell, leading to um, accumulation of stress granule. So to test this hypothesis, uh, we took um, mock or infected cell, collected the supernatant, eliminated the virus, um, inactivated this virus-free supernatant and confirmed that the virus-free supernatant is free of viral particle, it doesn't induce any CP, doesn't lead to viral replication, doesn't contain any uh, viral proteins or viral RNA. And when we treated cells with virus-free supernatant, we could see that canonical stress granule markers such as UBAP12, FXR1, or G3BP1 all relocated to cytoplasmic fossil. Okay? That are different or that look visually different from stress granule induced by arsenite, uh, but contain stress granule markers. And when we did a little bit more quantification, what we could see was that in cells treated with virus free supernatant, the number of foci would be higher than uh, in those treated with arsenite, and the foci would be smaller than those induced by arsenite. So the granules that we see, we get more than canonical SGs, and they're smaller than canonical SGs. So that's the first property of these foci. We then looked at whether their assembly was connected to transitional inhibition because it's a fundamental property of stress granule. So when you add cyclohexamide to block mRNA, uh, this assembly from polysome and entry into stress granule, you dissolve stress granule and G3BP1 goes back in the cytoplasm. However, the foci that we see with virus-free supernatant remain present even in the presence of stress of uh, cyclohexamide. So again, here, they don't seem to be coupled to transition inhibition. So different properties. We looked at their uh, kinetic of assembly uh, using um, various techniques such as uh, FRAP and uh, following their uh, kinetic assembly by live cell microscopy. And I guess the fundamental thing here is that uh, <coughs> we could see that um, the foci induced by uh, or that canonical stress granule take about 90 minutes to dissolve once you have washed out uh, arsenite. 
Whereas the foci induced by virus free supernatant would disassemble much more quickly, like 20 to 30 minutes. So again, a very fast uh, kinetic of recovery, different from other bodies that have been associated with uh, viruses. And finally, one of the, or oh, not finally, but one of the fundamental property of stress granules is that they absolutely depend on G3BP1 for their assembly. So when we take uh, cells that are G3BP1 knockout and stimulate them with arsenide, we can see that we don't form any stress granule, right? As opposed to, um, as opposed to, um, sorry, white type cells. When we took um, uh, knockout cells and stimulated them with virus-free supernatant, we still formed those SG lyphosides. So it really gave us a bunch of properties uh, that are fundamentally different from stress granule or from RNA-Zell bodies. And so we decided to call those stress granule like foci paracrine granule and really, you know, allowing us to say that they are different from other uh, bodies that assemble during viral infection. So they are different. What do they contain? What is their uh, biochemical makeup? So to answer that question, we used um, omics approaches that have been developed uh, by the Parker Lab at the University of Colorado um, that have been long uh, standing collaborators now uh, for characterizing virus-induced um, biocondensate. And so they've developed a procedure in which stress granule can be isolated by first lysing cells um, generating a granule enriched fraction through different uh, stages of differential centrifugation and then using a specific immuno uh, precipitation against um, G3BP1, you can tether individual SGs uh, onto dynabids. So you can see all those dots here, these three dots are individual stress granules that have been isolated. And then the beads can be analyzed for mass spectrometry or RNA-seq to characterize the RNA content and the protein content of stress granule. So first, uh, let's have a look at the protein composition. So the first thing that we did was to compare the protein composition of paracrine granule to that of canonical stress granule. And we can see that there is very little overlap, okay, confirming that these are different type of biocondensate. There are properties that are common. So importantly, they are enriched in uh, proteins with uh, low complexity domain, which are the disorder proteins that are important for condensation and uh, precipitation of um, proteins in stress granule. They are enriched in RNA binding proteins, again, fundamental property of all these uh, bodies, but importantly, they lack initiation factors. So stress granules always contain initiation factors because they are enriched in stalled transition complexes. Paracrine granules don't contain initiation factors. And um, I'm not going to go into the details of all the other pathways that are uh, associated with uh, or that are uh, functionally enriched at the protein level. But interestingly, we have proteins that are, we have pathways associated with cell death and uh, cell to cell communication. So we, which could feed into that hypothesis of paracrine uh, signal. Um, so again, here, different properties, they lack uh, initiation factors. We then looked at um, the RNA composition of these granules and uh, to try and make the story user friendly. What I would focus on here is the fact that um, what differentiates them from stress granules is that the mRNAs that are targeted to, to paracrine granules tend to be longer than those that are enriched in stress granules. Okay, so if we just look at, let's say, size distribution. If we look at um, the nature of the RNAs that are enriched in paracrine granule or stress granule, again, there is not a lot of overlap. However, if we look at the functional pathways, 
enrich in paracrine granule or stress granule, we can see that um, they are very similar. So the colors here, uh, the light blue, represent functional pathways that are conserved in paracrine granule and stress granule. So what it tells us is that although different RNAs are triaged or sorted into paracrine granule and stress granule, they actually belong to similar functional pathways. Okay, or well, and functional classes that are associated with regulation of wind signaling, um, signal trans transduction, uh, and notch signaling, which we are all trying to follow up at the moment to see how this feeds into the, the paracrine signaling uh, hypothesis. We then search for motifs within the mRNA uh, triaged into stress granule. And interestingly, what we could see was that, and of course, we identified motifs, but I guess what matters is that um, the top five motifs enriched in mRNAs that are found in paracrine granule are all binding sites for specific proteins that we see enriched in the granules. So for example, protein from the SRSF uh, splicing factors family, uh, HUR, HNRNPC, SF uh, RF1, we also have uh, G3BP1 and G3BP2. And so what it tells us is that potentially those proteins are important for selectively triaging subset of mRNAs that contain those motifs into the stress granule. Okay, so it gives us a bit of an idea of among the whole population of protein, which are the ones that are important for uh, triaging mRNAs in granules. So finally, um, are, they, um, are they associated with translational shutoff? So yes, if we measure ribopyromycin, um, ribopyromycylation assays in uh, cells treated with virus-free supernatant, we see a strong shutoff. Um, so, which is a property uh, that's uh, common between SGs and paracrine granules. If we look at the cellular signaling pathway, pathways that get activated upon virus-free supernatant treatment, basically we see an increase in EF12 phosphorylation and an increase in ERK uh, phosphorylation. However, when we either um, genetically block EIF2 alpha signaling or use a pharmacological inhibitor of ERK, we don't prevent paracrine granule uh, assembly. So, what we think, um, so here we think that ERK signaling is important downstream of paracrine granule assembly rather than upstream, and we don't think that uh, the assembly of paracrine granule requires EF2 alpha phosphorylation. So, last question, does it actually matter for the virus? And so, if we treat cells with virus free supernatant and measure viral titers, what happened? Well, we see a dose dependent inhibition of viral replication, suggesting that paracrine granules are coupled with antiviral activity. So we end up with a bunch of uh, properties here that really convince us that we have uh, characterized a new type of stress granule-like biocondensate that do not require polysome disassembly or the stress granule nucleating protein G3BP1. Their dynamic is different. Their resident protein are different. They lack uh, initiation factor, they are enriched for proteins associated with wind signaling and metabolism. They enrich different RNAs, but that belong to similar functional classes. And they are associated with shutoff and antiviral activity. Now, there's one big question that we haven't answered, which is, what is the mediator? What is the molecule in the supernatant that triggers um, paracrine granule assembly? Is that conserved in other virus models? So if you take another virus, stimulate cell, generate a virus-free supernatant, can you also identify these uh, biocomponents? And I haven't got the answer uh, to these questions uh, yet. So finally, we can come up in a model in which for 
feline KBC virus, early in infection, we have sensing of the virus and induction of stress granule that are going to be disassembled by the activity of the viral protease that cleaves G3BP1. And at this stage, uh, infected cells will signal to bystander cells that are not infected yet, inducing the assembly of paracrine granules that will, in a way, in our model, slow down or reduce the propagation of uh, viral particle and slow down uh, infection. So I will um, leave it there for today and remind you of uh, you know, the kind of four key messages. So norovirus infection induces a metabolic stress that uh, promotes replication. It blocks stress granule assembly by repurposing G3BP1 in replication complexes. FCV inhibits stress granule by cleaving G3BP1 and induces the formation of novum stress granule-like foci in bystander cell via a paracrine signaling mechanism leading to the formation of paracrine granule that we think are important in controlling the antiviral response. So that leaves me to um, thank, um, first of all, the, the founders, uh, UKRI, uh, our collaborators, um, across uh, for many years in different universities. So the Ruggieri Group in Heidelberg, the Good Fellow Group in Cambridge, the Parker Group uh, at the University of Colorado, uh, Martin Langerheis in Utrecht, and the people in my lab who contributed to this work. So Michelle, Valentina, uh, Belinda, Kushbu, and Lucy, uh, who, have done, um, who have been involved in the va various uh, aspects of uh, our uh, nor norovirus studies. Uh, and this work is now uh, carried on by uh, Matt uh, and uh, Emily. Thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions.